On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Just fantastic. How are you today? I'm doing great. And Lance, in this episode, we are bringing you the third in a series on Missing Nikki McCown. And in this one, we're speaking with Nikki's sister, Michelle, directly. And in the first two episodes, which we aired maybe like six weeks ago, um, we played some clips from Jen's interview with Michelle, but this time we speak to her directly, and uh, it's a really great conversation. It really is. Uh, this has been 20 years since Nikki has been missing, and I don't think a day has gone by where Michelle doesn't have the amount of passion and drive to find her sister as she exhibited in this conversation. Uh, there's, There's information here that we are following up on from our previous conversations that that Michelle clarifies and some development so you want to listen for that but you also want to really hear what she's saying again we talk about this um, secondary victims uh, effect all the time and this is a great example of it someone does something to somebody else and they just don't have the wherewithal to understand the ripple effect that it has throughout the entire family and friends. And Michelle is really the personification of that. That is a great call. And uh, these first two episodes we did were were really great and informative. And um, Michelle did have one update. So we do want to just update anytime anyone's got an update. Um, we're always willing to uh, to discuss and uh, and we, and in this we really added to um, what we had already done. So we definitely invite you to listen to those two episodes and then uh, and then catch up with this one. And of course, Nikki McCown went missing from Richmond, Indiana, on July twenty second, two thousand one. She was twenty eight years old at the time of her disappearance and five two and one hundred and fifteen pounds. And her full name is Marilyn Renee Nicole McCown. Uh, everyone called her Nikki. And you can get more information at helpfindnickymccown.wordpress.com. That's help find n i q u i m c c o w n dot wordpress dot com. And if you have any information about the disappearance of Nikki, please contact the Richmond, Indiana Police Department at 765-983-7247. And we'll put a link in the show notes to that as well. So thank you very much for listening. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM and check out that website as well, missingcsm.com. Michelle, how are you today? I'm okay. I'm doing pretty good. It's good to uh, finally speak with you. We've been in contact sort of through our private investigations for the missing researcher and our, uh, I guess, our primary point person to this particular disappearance. Um, 
through Jenna Mel. And uh, you've right. been you've been speaking with Jenna Mel as well, so we've been hearing a lot about you. And I just want to say it's great to finally put a well a virtual face to the name. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So your sister Nikki went missing in July of 2001. Right. I want to talk to you specifically about Tommy, but um, but Jen had mentioned that you have some updates um, before we get into other things. Well, one update I want to make is that the last time I did the interview, uh, although for the last 20 years, I've always thought that Tommy was a person that is responsible for my sister, I still always wondered about her fiance and and his uh, girlfriend and I just had um, got some information that can delete the girlfriend from the list of my 20 years of wondering and um, I found out some information that you know she wasn't even in town at that time so I can kind of scratch her off and as far as the fiance goes after the information I got in regards to Tommy, I can finally scratch the fiance off my list too. And you said this was information that you just received after how many years? After 20 years? So what I'm trying to say is like for 20 years, I've wondered, I've been back and forth. Was it Tommy? Was it this person, it was it, my list is probably I had at least a hundred people on it that I wondered were they responsible. I question everybody. Um, when you live in a not knowing stage, you don't know who's the person that took your loved one away, so you just wonder about everybody, basically. <laughs> There was a few that were at the top of that list. The ex-girlfriend of the fiance was one of them that was at my tip top. And I like as far as the fiance goes, I so much think he was involved. I just thought that his family or his ex-girlfriend was involved and I just can scratch that off. Okay, well that that's uh reassuring to hear because any progress is like uh, you know good progress. Um and the interesting part to me is how you came about this information. Can you give a little bit of a background on on the girlfriend and the fiance and why you thought that this was uh a particular uh interesting person of interest for you? And then what was the information that came your way? The girlfriend was someone Nikki had dealing with dealings with in high school. And then, as you know, he moved on to he uh, the Bobby moved on to California with the girlfriend, and then Nikki met her daughter's father and was with her daughter's father until they reconnected. You know, right before she came up, it's, they reconnected probably in um, 97, 98. and then. Throughout that time that they were together, Nikki always had run-ins with the ex-girlfriend. So, you know, she seemed like she had a problem with him wanting to marry my sister. So she was at the top of my list. And she stayed at the top of my list because, you know, I knew that they had questioned her, but I, I knew it was over the telephone. But... I didn't know that they had, you know, spoke to her and knew she was really out of town. I didn't know that they had proved that she was really out of town until recently. So that's how I got to where I'm at today. So you, was this uh, from a conversation with police? I asked uh, the detective and she said we spoke to her and that she was out of town and you know, we had no other reasons to believe that she was, you know, wasn't out of town. So she was out of town. So we're going to continue to focus on Mr. Swift. So I'm going to take her at her word. And every time I start, it seemed like I always give back to Mr. Swint. And Mr. Swint being uh, Tommy Swint, 
who was described as a longtime friend and co-worker of Nikki's. And uh, there was some rumor that they might have had a romantic relationship, but this was somebody who was also very volatile, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I do want to clarify that, too. When there, I did, you probably see me on a lot of podcasts, okay? When I spoke to uh, Ed from another podcast, I stated to him that Nikki had went out on a date with uh, Mr. Flint which she did. But as far as dating, I don't know if everybody's confusing the two. Going out on a date and dating is two different things. To me, at least. Uh, she didn't um, date him like that. She did go out on a date. When they first met, she did go out on a date with him. He took her shopping. And he wanted more than what she was wanting from him she just wanted him to be her a good friend and they were like brother and sister the way she looked at him so i did want to clear that up because i've done cleared that up like a hundred times and i keep getting the same people ask me the same question about it right and i do think there is a difference there one date is not dating Mm -hmm. um so that's good to clarify that and nikki uh per you, was not interested in Tommy um, for a relationship like that. No. And, you know, after I've did so many of these podcasts, and I don't know if my wording caught them the wondering if it was dating or date, but it was one date. I want to clarify that today. It was one date that I know of. Now, what Nikki did that I didn't know about is another thing. She could have went on another date with him, and I just didn't know. But I personally only know the one time that they went to the mall together. And I know they were real good friends, and they would go from time to time. They would go shopping and to eat. But as far as me knowing as a date, I only knew the one time. I just knew they were good friends, really good friends. And can you provide a little insight into how they met? I think that was a little... In unclear for us they met at their job they worked yep. at the the prison together mm-hmm. and that's how she met him he worked there before her when she started when she started there he was already had been working there for a while yeah okay and yeah. obviously that's where they had met and okay and bonded but um Never, never dated. Want to be totally clear with that. Never dated. One date, and she considered him like, uh, like a brother. No, but you know, I, th- I just felt like I needed to clear that up because mm-hmm. it had been a little confusing that family was saying, you know, why did you tell them that they were dating? They only went on the one date, and I said, well, where it started from was when I did a news. I talked to the news and I had told that woman that Nikki had went on a date with him. And from that point on, I've been explaining that word since then. And I just want to clear that up. Nothing against anyone that has said it. By no means, like I said, maybe they just didn't understand by what I was saying when I was talking. Because you know, when you do these interviews, you can get tongue tied. You know, this so many. Yeah, and then there's always interpretation, and um, sometimes you know things can get uh, slightly, uh, slightly off. Sometimes the media can be misleading. Mm-hmm. Not you guys, of course, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do you do your best trying to get the most accurate information out there, but semantics kind of get mixed up over time, and then you have to revisit it and just remind people, no, this is what the actual phrasing was no, and- but you know because when i did when i did my uh podcast with mr ed uh, i love mr ed he, he's a really good uh guy a real good friend of mine but he didn't you know i don't know if when i did an interview if he didn't understand what i was saying because my mom was in the hospital i was outside if you ask him about that interview, I was outside in a parking lot trying to do this interview. This, the, you know, we kept losing signal and every it was all over the place. Would you mind uh, 
recounting the story um, that you told Jen um, about when you had gone over to Nikki's place and Tommy was there and there was a bit of an altercation. I was on my lunch break. I stopped by Nikki's house. She didn't live too far from where I worked at. And I stopped by her house and I heard some yelling through the door. So instead of knocking on the door, I just walked in because the door was unlocked. And she's sitting on a chair and he's laying, he's leaning over. She's got her foot into his chest the way he was hovering over her. And I said, what are you doing to my sister? And she said, get off of me. He's trying to rape me. I said, get off my sister. And then he started chasing us both around. Then he started chuckling, act like he was playing around. And he left. So she was, Nikki was uh, sort of kicking him off of her? She had her foot in his chest. And she said, get him off of me. He's trying to rape me. And then he leaned up. She got up and he started to chase us both around her house. And then he left. He said, I'm just playing. And he left. Was his change in behavior like that abrupt or did he seem to calm down or was it like a switch? It was kind of like a switch. Like he had, um, he instantly just like shrugged it off. Like I'm just playing around. How long into their relationship was this? Okay. She started working there in around 94 and this was probably... Maybe three or four years later. When he chased you both around um, the house, how long did that did that part of this uh, last? Not very long at all. It only lasts to like, she lived in a little two-bedroom apartment. We ran to the back, and he chased us to the back room, the back bedroom, and then he turned around, and he started chuckling, and then he said, I'm just playing, and he left. And did you close the door and, and like lock the door? Like you guys, you moved away from him quickly? Yeah, he left and we locked the door and I said, what was he doing? And she said, he was trying to get on top of me. I felt like he was trying to rape me. And then I was like, I told you to quit being his friend. Why do you still talk to that guy? And she was like, we're, we're just... You know, we work together. And I said, well, we don't have to have him at your house. And that was the end of the conversation. Did you ever speak to him after that? Or was that the last time you spoke to him? I didn't see him no more after that for quite some time. But not too much after that was when, when I was telling Jen about Nikki, her tires being sliced. Not too much after that. Well, uh, yeah, I want to get into the the tires being slashed, but still want to dig into this, um, I guess, near attack or attack on Nikki by him. Was there ever a conversation about calling the police or was it not? It didn't really escalate to the point where you felt like you had to. She really, she just kind of brushed it off. She was just like, I thought he was trying to uh, rape me. And I said, well, why do you, you know, she said that that was her, her coworker. And I said, well, why do you still have to have him in your house? And she just brushed it off. Like, you know, so after, you know, too much after that, we never talked about it no more. I don't know if she thought if, She thought that he was just playing if he explained himself when they got to work or what, but she didn't say nothing else about it. I didn't bring it up either. And then how many days later were her tires slashed? I can't tell you the days, but I know it wasn't too much. It was around the same time. I don't know. I believe it was a few months later. I can remember, right, because I remember her calling me, asking me to, to take her to get new tires but her and bobby tires all four of her tires and two of bobby's 
But Bobby was under the impression that it was her daughter's father that did it. But Nikki pulled me to the side and told me it wasn't him, it was Tommy, and that she was trying, he loaned her some money and he didn't want her to pay him back with cash. He wanted she he wanted her to join him and one of his friends. She said, No, I don't do stuff like that. So this is a suggestion that he wanted a, a threesome with her and, yeah. and one of his friends, and she declined, obviously. Right. And it was soon after that the tires were slashed? Yeah. So she she figured that it makes sense that that would have been retaliation. Yeah, he caught her that night. The night before the tires were slashed is when he... He knew she was getting paid the next day. She was going to pay him back the money he had loaned her. And he called her and said, you know, that money you owe, you owe me, you can pay by joining me and my friend on the threesome. And she said, no, I don't do stuff like that. I will give your money back. Then the next day they wake up and their tires are slushed. And then he let her know. He called her and told her. You know, you should have done what I said and you wouldn't be waking up with your tires slashed. He told her that. I believe, deep down inside, I believe Nikki was scared of him. Yeah. But, but I never understood their relationship because she would still be his friend. And I don't know if she was that scared of him that she felt like if she didn't talk to him, that it, he would get worse. Because I've heard a lot of things about him with other women that he's he's did like a lot of strange things to. And I witnessed one with Darlene, one incident with Darlene I witnessed myself when I um, went to the prison. This was after Nikki came up missing. And Tommy had came in. I was sitting in the lobby waiting on flyers because they used to make us flyers. And Tommy came in and he seen me over on the side and he, he waved and then he, he actually walked over there where I was sitting. I was with my niece and uh, he kind of had his head down, asked me how the family was and all that. And then he walked away. And then Darlene walked in and she seen me sitting there and she just went straight to the time clock. He was over there waiting for her. And he pointed at me and he told her she could go. I heard him tell her you could go over there and talk to her. And she finally went over there and said, hi, how's your family? And she had her head down while she was talking to me. She seemed very nervous, very nervous. And uh, me and my niece, after we walked out of there, we was like, wow, that was really weird. Why did she only come and talk to us whenever he told her she could go over there? And this was Darlene, who yeah. was Nikki's friend, but also romantically involved with Tommy as well at one point, right? His girlfriend, yeah. At that time, it, she still was his girlfriend? Mm-hmm. And was he married still at that time? Yes. But he was also um, rumored to be a pimp or be in, in sex work? Yes. How confirmed uh, do you know that to be? By um, his, his daughter's mother, I spoke to her, and she told me that she did, like, a lot of weird things for him, and he used to make her do a lot of things like you would do for a pimp. And um, how, many, how many women did you, do you think he worked with like that? I don't know, because I know the, the, the Tina Ivory that he was indicted for, it was, you know, put, it was word around that he was her pimp. So I don't know how long he was doing that, but I do know on occasions when he would give Nikki a ride home from work or something. I remember one particular time Nikki had told me that he took her down this street where there was these hookers at and she had on a, a ball cap and two of them walked over to the car and asked him what he needed. And he said, how much for both of us? And then Nikki raised her head up. She said, what are you talking about? You're giving me a ride home. 
when she got into the house, she told me, she said, he is really sick. I said, you need to quit riding home with him. By all accounts, from what we've heard through through Jen, through you, Nikki wasn't really in the position to... She, she didn't need to be involved with sex work. I mean, she had... She had a good job. She seemed to be very uh, self-sustaining. She wasn't, she didn't need to be in the sex work. because She didn't do that kind of work. But Tommy was into finding women like that. His previous relationships were like that. But, you know, the co-worker, the Darlene, she didn't do that kind of stuff, as far as I know of. Nikki didn't do that kind of stuff. But, uh his daughter's mother said that he made her do a lot of weird things like that. And in the Tina Ivory, those are the only two women I know that did it outside of Nikki telling me I'm trying to pick up hookers. Right. It it does sound like he he tried to groom other women um, besides the two uh, for sure. Um, so it makes me wonder um, how many more he tried to uh, get into situations like that. I don't know, but I know that uh, the his daughter's mother told me that he made her do a lot of weird things, and she used to meet up, meet him up at a hotel. That's what she told me. And this hotel in town is known as the hotel where you you pick up you know, prostitutes, it's a really terrible, it's not around anymore, but it was a really terrible hotel. She told me that he used to make her do a lot of things that she wasn't proud of. She was talking to me. She said, I'm not proud of the things that he made me do. I don't know how many other women that he was their pimp. I just know the Tina Ivory and what the daughter's mother told me. But I know he didn't do that for Nikki. Nikki was, he definitely wasn't her pit. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. And you mentioned uh, Tina Ivory, and that's the young woman who's 33 years old who was murdered in 1991 and wrapped in a quilt in a trash bag. She'd been strangled and beaten and Tommy he still is the prime suspect in this is is that accurate yeah they had an indictment for him so I guess they had found the DNA on the on what it said in the news found the DNA around the tape or something like that and unfortunately that's when he shot himself was when they yeah. were yeah and he took all the he probably took all the answers we need right with him that's what it seems like but i'm hoping that there's somebody else out there that knows and i think that person is darlene oh you think darlene um has some information yeah i do my sister talked to her that day she came up missing. Okay. She talked to her. Darlene was living with Tommy at the time. This is not, this is eight tenths of a mile from where her vehicle was found. Okay. Say for this, Darlene told me herself, Nikki just asked about some hair and nail products. But they time those calls, they record those calls at the prisons and they time them. So the police know, the detectives know exactly how long they was on the phone. So she's telling us that she was only talking to her for a brief second, but we know that she talked to her longer than a brief second. So what else did they talk about? And if Nikki was looking for hair and nail products, vitamins because she had Graves disease and she was getting ready for her wedding and she wanted to look right on her wedding which any woman would want my theory is that Tommy was at the house she told her she could go by and get some of her hair and nail products and she went by there knowing what I know about Tommy how I walked in on him with my sister's foot in his chest, 
maybe this time there was nobody knocking on, on the door to startle him and stop it. Maybe it went all the way through. And that's why she's missing now. What were Nikki's feelings on Darlene? She uh, she was friendly with her. She didn't uh, feel the same way that she felt with about Tommy. She was friends with them all. She was friends with them both. She was very good friends with them both. Yeah. And that's where I'm confused at because if Darlene has nothing to hide, then you think she would come forth and be more eager to clear her, you know, her name with the police because they, you know, they questioned her before. And she am short of wanting to talk to him anymore. So if she's my sister's friend and me being and my family wanting to talk to her and wanting to find out, you know, what exactly did you talk about? Do you know anything more that can help us with this? And she refuses to talk. What is she hiding? Why does she being so kind of standoffish? And it's like she's hiding something. And she might not be. She might not really know anything. We got to accept the fact that she might not know anything. But for her not to want to talk to us, got us wondering, like, why won't you talk to us? Yeah, you you mentioned you know maybe she would want to clear her name, but uh, uh, in addition to that, I feel like she would want to just clear her head, like clear her conscience about this whole thing, because I mean she was close with Nikki and she was obviously close to Tommy, and she's supposed to be her friend. She's they were good friends, you know. Why would you not want to help your good friend? Your good friend is missing. Why would you not do everything in your power to find out what happened to him when you know you may have been one of the last people that talked to her if you did nothing wrong? Mm -hmm. We know she talked to you on the phone, so you may be one of the last people that we know talked to her. So why not? Why would you not want to help? Why are you hindering? It don't make sense to me. So I think that she knows something. And I think that she's keeping something because she's scared that something the police may look at her as being either involved or holding up an investigation because it's been going on for 20 years now. We're on our second detective. I mean, even if she didn't know anything, she could extend the courtesy to you and say it's too painful for me to revisit, which is why I just can't say anything. But her absolute silence is just sort of speaking volumes right now when there there has been so much time that's passed. And there's you said they're on the second detective at the uh, yeah. for, with law enforcement. If she if she really didn't have anything to hide, I mean, just simply say again, if you if it's too painful, just communicate that just say it's too painful for you to talk about it but the more you go silent through all of this through all the years through the detectives through your efforts it just doesn't make sense uh unless it's, she's just a completely callous person a cold par person and i really don't believe you know i've been i've went out with her and nikki a few times and she doesn't really seem like the person that She's showing me that she really is because the person that I went out to, she seemed like a really per a good person, good hearted person that really had my sister's best interest. You know, she seemed really nice. Like she really was her friend. And I could, and it seems like a total different person. And I know the circumstances are different because Nikki's missing now and she's, you know, the police want to talk to her and stuff again. But if that's your real friend, you're going to do whatever you can, especially if you have nothing to worry. If you didn't do anything wrong, you're going to do what you have to to prove. I didn't do nothing wrong. That's my friend. Why would I do anything to hurt my friend? I can't speak for Tommy, but I know I didn't do anything wrong. And Darlene was already kind of dodgy about the length of the last phone call she had with Nikki. Exactly. 
She says she only talked to her for a little. Uh, she says she just asked her about some hair and the vitamins. And that was the end of the conversation. She told them where to get them, and that was it. But they know that she talked to her longer than just that three seconds. That I mean, it don't take that long to say, where can I get some hair and nail vitamins? And have you communicated that discrepancy to law enforcement? Oh, they pinpointed out to us. Like, you know, she talked to her longer than that time. So we know she talked to her longer than that time. And then... You had mentioned that she was acting weird at at the prison, right? She had uh, right. been told by Tommy it was okay to go and and talk to you, and you said she was acting weird. I just wanted to revisit that for a moment and um, see if if you could add any any more detail to uh, when you say she was acting weird uh, during that interaction. She okay when she walked in. When she noticed me to the her right side, when she walked in, I was sitting on the right side of her. She didn't glance my way at all. She just kind of had her head down. And then she walked over to the time clock. Tommy walked over there and pointed that I was over there with my niece. And he and I could we could both hear him say, "You can go over there and talk to them." It's like she wouldn't have came over there had he not told her, it's okay, you go over there and talk to them. And then when she got over there to us, she had her head down. How's your family? I'm praying for you. Let me know if you need anything. And she walked away with her head down. Now that came, that was very strange. And when me and my niece walked out, we was like, what was all that about? Why did she have to have permission to come and say, ask us how we were doing? I mean, Nikki had not been missing very long at that time. So, you know, everybody else that was there, you know, clocking in and out, they came right over and, you know, everybody was house of family and stuff like that. So it seemed like she's the only one that had to be pushed to come and say anything. And if Darlene has knowledge, but wasn't directly involved in anything, would you be able to forgive her for the years of silence if she were to come forward with something? That's a tough one. I still wonder if I really would believe her. And that's hard to say because I really deep down inside believe after talking to so many of their coworkers, every time I talk to one of their coworkers, they tell me the person you need to talk to is, is Darlene. Every single coworker at that place that I've spoken to, and it's been at least 10 or 15 of them. Now they all keep telling me to go talk to Darlene. There has to be reason why they all feel the same way. So she even came forth to tell me I have nothing to do with it. I'm sorry it took me so long to come forth, but, you know, I just didn't know how to. I still would wonder if she was still hiding something because I do believe that there's something she's not, something's not adding up. I mean, I'm not saying she actually is involved or anything, but I think she's keeping something away from the police that can help. Because, you know, there might just be that little piece that can help solve this. And I think she's keeping something from them. And I could be completely wrong, but I, I know I would always wonder that. With Darlene, there's no been no back and forth. I haven't heard from her since that that time that I seen her in her job. I haven't talked to her since. That's twenty years ago. Do you know where she is still? She still work at that prison. I was just told that she still works at that prison. One of their coworkers said, Why don't you go down there and see if she'll talk to you? I know that won't go well because she's going to be upset that I'm at her job and we're going to be going back and forth because 
you know, that's my sister and that's her job. And she feels like that I'm pinpointing, blaming her for something which she may be, which she may not have did. And I'm blaming her. So I don't think it would go right. But if we could meet up somewhere and we both could be calm, even if we have somebody with each one of us to make sure that there's somebody there to make sure that we don't get into a heated back and forth, I would I would love to do that with Darlene. But I'm just not going to show up at her job. I don't think that would be right to just show up at the woman's job. It would sort of be like blindsiding her, and if it doesn't go over well, then you're not getting anything right. ever again. So it's a it's a smart move to plan it out a little bit more, I guess, uh, politely, and and make sure yeah. that she knows that you are you know you're you're going to be there with her uh, instead of the blindsiding method. Even if we had we doing what like me and you doing right now on a Zoom or something like that, I would do that with her. I would talk to her on FaceTime, anything. We don't have, if she doesn't want to meet up with me, that's fine. I just want to talk to her. And I want to be able to see her because I believe you can tell if somebody's lying by the eye contact and everything. And I want to talk to her face to face because I believe she's keeping something from my family. Yeah, I think that this is a perfectly reasonable request after so long. You said at the beginning of this conversation that you've lived so long in, an, I think you you said, an unknowing state. And you've had hundreds of people that you've been considering, and you never stop thinking about who might be responsible for this. I would hope that someone in her position would see the residual effects of what's happened and and how this has caused you to be suspicious of everybody that may have been in Nikki's life ever. Uh, yeah, everybody. I would hope that that would justify a half hour conversation, whether it's face to face or over Zoom or, or FaceTime or something. I mean, you, 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 you've earned that, I, I would hope. I just want to talk to her. She might not have nothing to do with it. But I know she talked to Nikki that day and the conversation and there was a, there's another thing I forgot to mention. She called me. I don't know if I mentioned it. She called me and she said, why did you tell the detectives that um, I wasn't there on Monday, but I came on Tuesday and I said, Darlene, you was there on Tuesday because I went to Nikki's job on Monday to see if she came into work yet. And they told me she didn't show up. And I remember running into you and Tommy and he told me that he might be in there later that day, but they were both coming the next day. And she said, I didn't say that. I said I was coming there on Monday with him. And I said, well, I don't remember that. And, every, and I asked my siblings, and they said that they thought it was Tuesday, too. So I don't know. But it was about three or four months later. And she said, well, why did you guys react so fast? I mean, maybe Nikki's embarrassed. I said, embarrassed? She said, yeah, y'all took it right to the media, got all this attention on her. Maybe she's just too embarrassed to be seen now. And I said, that, what are you saying? You're saying that you know where my sister's at? Where's she at? If she's embarrassed, where she's at, where is she? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, what if? And then she hung up. Well, come to find out the detectives was over her house at that day. And they told her to call me because I told them that she was there Tuesday and she's saying she was there Monday. That is a bit of a an on story. So she called you in uh, out of anger. It sounded yeah. Like. She was trying to call me out and trying to prove to them that I was lying. And she was there Monday, but everybody in my family said it was Tuesday. And then she said the most off the wall said something about why did y'all go to the media so fast? What if she's just too embarrassed to come out? I'm like, so you know where she's at? 
you know where my sister's at? No, I'm not saying. I'm just saying, what if? I said, we could say, what if all day long? Yeah, that strikes me as as, as a bit peculiar, blaming um, you know, you and your family for uh, seeking publicity for your missing sister uh, would not cast uh, embarrassment on on your missing sister if she had gone missing. That's the opposite. It was like she was saying, like, if y'all wouldn't have took her, if y'all wouldn't embarrass her and put her on the news so fast, then maybe she would come forth. So why? I'm like, what does, I mean, I thought that's what you do. Because when people come up missing, we went to a missing person uh, agency before we even did anything. And they told us to keep her out in the media. Keep her name out there. People got to know who they're looking for. They got to know what kind of vehicle they're looking for. So what are you even talking about? What what a ridiculous thing to say. I mean, it's it, if she was embarrassed, she would have she would have called you and said, "That was really embarrassing. I am here." Exactly. I mean, come on. Nikki's leaving her daughter, her her wedding that she wanted so badly, her mother, her father, her siblings. Why would she just No, Nikki's not that type of person. For one, she don't get embarrassed easy. And for two, she would not do that to her daughter, most of all, her daughter. Yeah, you and your family seeking publicity about Nikki having gone missing could not be the reason why Nikki went missing. That's uh, disingenuous of her to say that. Yeah. But she said that to me. You mentioned um, Nikki's daughter, uh, Peyton. How's Peyton holding up? She's doing good. She's doing good. good. She's at, you know, Peyton's, uh, a, a, she's 29 now. So she's kind of take charge. She's, tar- she's starting to take charge of her mom's case now. She's doing everything she possibly can to, to bring an answer to it. And she's um, doing a really good job. That's great to hear. Good. Is she communicating with law enforcement and trying to get records and interviews yeah she's doing she's doing all that and uh we just had an event on the 22nd of july for nikki uh there's some new owners that that own the laundromat now they uh they bought the laundromat and they're turning into uh kind of like a center for you know uh people that are on drugs and stuff like that a recovery center and they had an event for Nikki on the 22nd. They paid for everything and Peyton and them came together and they did, they had a really nice event for Nikki. And then uh, we were just the, the Glen Miller park there in Richmond, Indiana. They are allowing us to put a bench up, with Nikki's name and information on it. The manager at Lowe's bought the bench, bought the plaque, and we're trying to get it up around the time Nikki was supposed to get married, which is August 18. So it'd probably be a few, maybe a week or two after that. But at, we're trying to do it around a happy time Nikki and Bobby took some great photos for their wedding at that park. And now we're going to place a bench there with her name and information there. The manager at Lowe's, we owe him a whole bunch of gratitude for doing that. Because that was something my mom really wanted before she passed away. That's really awesome that they, uh, they're they doing that. And I love the idea of focusing it around a special day that was supposed to be happy, you know, and not like an anniversary of a disappearance. I think that, uh, I think that helps when people are looking for their loved one to focus yeah. on what made that person special and what made them, you know, contribute in a, in a positive way and what made other people happy. So, um, yeah, happy, happy to hear that you're doing it that way. Yeah. I mean, that was something Nikki was really looking forward to is her wedding. She really was. And she had 
you know, I was going to be a bridesmaid. She have she had about seven or eight bridesmaids and a matriarch. It was going to be a big wedding. It's like she had rainbow colors, and she was about to do it big for the, her special day, and she wanted to look her best. And so when Darlene said she was looking for those hair and nail vitamins. I could see Nikki wanting to look for those hair and nail vitamins because she had Graves' disease and her hair was starting to fall out. And those hair and nail vitamins prevent that from happening. So it makes sense that she would ask her, but the whole conversation didn't last longer than just with that. For sure. And, and honestly, if... if uh if she's listening, if Darlene is listening, if, if she catches wind of the conversations that we've been having about Nikki, open door policy for her to come on, to talk to us to five minutes. Come yeah. on and we'll put it out as a little special episode and see what she has to say. It would be, it'd be great to connect the two of you if that's a possibility. I'll put it out there again, like op- open door policy. That yeah. would be wonderful. And, you, you know, because... Nikki worked at this prison and all of those people there were, were like brothers and sisters to her, you know, for her. she worked there for quite some time. They become her family outside of her real family. When we have like little vigils and stuff for Nikki, I've not seen not one of them come out in her support. And that really bugs the wrong way. Like, you know, you guys... I always thought like law enforcement and stuff like that, they kind of made this brotherhood and they kind of stuck together. I don't see that here. And it's kind of sad that they never come to any, and they've never came to any of her events like this. For the last 20 years, I've not seen them come into anything of hers. And it's really sad. And I would love if... Darlene would at least come to your show and talk to me. I'll even I'll even protect it a little bit more and say you don't even have to come on. You can just shoot us a message. We can have a conversation offline. We right. can we can just talk in you know a written a written statement. We'll read it. Just I just it just baffles me. It's your it's your friend. If it's too painful to vis- to revisit, simply say that or or say say something. Just something. It's twenty years of twenty years of silent torment. Come on. How I would explain that to her is my niece, Nikki's daughter, has to live with this every day of her life. It's not it's painful, as painful as it is for her. Come on, darling, you can't you can't use that as an excuse. Because I watched my grieving father within three years of Nikki being missing. He passes away from grieving so much because he feels like he fell short to protect his daughter. My mom, I watched her just five months before, five, six months before she passed away. I watched her being wheeled into the police station, leaned over with cancer all through her body just so she could talk to the detective to try to get information about her baby. You're talking about revisiting pain? No, you have no clue. So Darlene needs to come on here or reach out some kind of way because we need to talk woman to woman, just talk. I ain't talking about anything, but just grown women talking. That's all I want. 